It is again my honor to welcome you to the Indigenous Law Conference 2016 and welcome from all points of the, the, uh, the world, Mother Earth. Uh, we are happy to, uh, to host you at this spectacular event. Uh, today we look forward to uh, uh, many opportunities for exchange of ideas and, and good thinking from everybody. We're confident that you come with good hearts and good minds and to participate in this, this, this forum. Uh, as we indicated last night, you know, we certainly want to, to begin our conversation from the, the beginning of traditional law. Traditional law is our belief systems, our understanding. And it existed here for thousands and thousands of years before the conquerors came to invade and, and, and place their concepts there, as we had mentioned last night in Deborah's presentation, their psychoses upon our people. And that psychoses have ultimately evolved to be Indian law and policy. So today we want to begin in a good way. And we've asked our lovely Henrietta Mann, Dr. Henrietta Mann, a very distinguished lady, one of the first Native women to achieve a doctorate status in the United States. A trailblazer academically, but also very close to her traditional roots, her traditional beliefs. And we would like to have Henry open it up for us today. So thank you, Henry.
Good morning and welcome. You know, it was very appropriate that we as seventh generation were welcomed into the homelands of the people who have lived here for all time. We do not go into anyone's homelands without their permission. So we went to the beach to play. <laughs> and we walked where our, our ancestors have walked for all time. And if you look on the back of our cards, you look on the web page of Seventh Generation, we have a few words that say, be a good ancestor. That's all we want to be. And that's all we should be. We want to be good ancestors to those that come after us, to our children, to our grandchildren, for all of them that come after us. And it is my honor to welcome you to this morning's session. It was wonderful to hear Deborah Sanchez speak last night. What an opening. Words we know are so powerful. Words have a power of their own. They are so powerful that we have to be careful sometimes how we use them. And the way they were used last night reminded us of so many things. Of those people that stand. as the water protectors at stand. I have wanted to go. And seventh generation said that I could. But there comes a time when, at my age, I say, you know, it's time for the younger generation to do this just as it is time for you that are in the field of law to do what you must. That is why I am sitting here to hear what you have to say to, to all of us. It is very appropriate that this third World Indigenous Law Conference is being held on our beloved Turtle Island, the grandmother or mother of the indigenous peoples of this land, on the land of the Khama Wustania, the simple, ordinary people of this land, the Khama Wustania those of us that have been here for all time, those of us that were here first, those of us that are going to still be here when others are long gone. I think we should, before I begin, very humbly offer some thanksgivings for this day. I think we should remember to offer thanks for life. 
for grandparents, for parents, for you, all of you, and especially all of the exquisite and sacred grandchildren and children of the world. And let us remember to offer thanks for the ability to see, to hear, to touch, to smell, to taste, which a student of mine at the University of Montana called the five wonders of life. She couldn't answer what the seven wonders of life were, and so she put those down, and I thought, well, that's very unique thinking. I think I better give her some credit. We do things like that, didn't we, Georgie? <laughs> Old school teachers. And let us remember to offer thanks for this beautiful day. The sun, the sky, air, the ocean and this precious soil. And of course, I want to ask things for me. I want to ask for the ability to speak in a kind and a good way. You know, there is much knowledge about indigenous law. to use the title of our, uh, of our uh, conference theme here. Rights, responsibilities, resilience, an international discourse on indigenous people's jurisprudence. My, what a mouthful. <laughs> if I said that in Cheyenne, it'd be three times as long, I'm sure. <laughs> But can you imagine all of that knowledge that each of you brings to this sacred center of time and space? I really look forward to learning from you. Do you realize how much knowledge that each of you carries? Do you realize how much mind power sits in this room? Goodness gracious. I'd like to be able to take that, bottle that. And I wouldn't sell it. I would take it and plant it at a time capsule for all of our grandchildren to unearth. But for now, very quickly, I, I would briefly like to share with you a little from our Zetistas, which is our name for ourselves, the Cheyennes, some, our, some indigenous knowledge. Yeah, we have to look at our own traditional knowledge systems, our traditional ways of being, of, uh, of knowing. And uh, believe it or not, as a peoples, we are governed by indigenous laws established by our great prophet, Mojiyoy. My uncle told me that this great prophet was so powerful that the mere uttering of his name brings a blessing. Mojiyoy, sweet medicine. And he was given our laws inside Noah was, which is bare butte. And Bear Butte sits on the periphery of the Black Hills. It's our sacred teaching mountain. And all of the spirit powers of the world had gathered within Bear Butte, Noah was, to teach Mutsi'i over a period of four years. And after he had taught, they had taught him all that he needed to know, 
he brought this wonderful knowledge from out of that spiritually generous place and taught the people. Can you imagine all of the spirit powers of the world that had congregated within that mountain? It's a hollow mountain. All of those spirit powers, Thunderbird, Father, Son, Grandmother Moon, Morning Star, Hummingbird, Bear, Buffalo, Dragonfly, Butterfly, on and on and on, every spirit power gathered there to teach him, to teach him the ways that he carried out to bring to us as statistics. And as instructed, Montego instituted a sophisticated representative government that he called the Council of 44. 44 peace chiefs to administer these laws. He also established four warrior societies to carry out these council chiefs' instructions. And these council chiefs decided what the sentence would be for murder if it occurred or honey violations. But there was a separation of civil and military powers. And the Tzitzitas were governed by these systems of laws and the citizens had certain rights and responsibilities. Simply stated, however, the basic four laws that governed Tzitzitas behavior or actions were these. One, never murder another Cheyenne. Two, never marry another Cheyenne. <laughs> And then we had another very, very important great law of life. And it just doesn't apply to us. I think you could take that and it applies to many indigenous nations around the world. A great law of life. And it's a, contained in the account of our beginnings as a people. And it is our most sacred story that expresses what I, would, I call a circle in motion. And when my hill, my hill, the great one, completed a certain part of creation, he called the four most powerful spirits to him. He had created these four spirits entirely with the force of his thoughts and asked that they watch over him as he created the world. And he called them to him so that he could place them in their homes in the four directions of the universe. And Mahia is both male and female. And from those directions, they were to watch over the humans, the human beings, and, and over Mahia's entire creation. And he assigned the first one to the southeast, giving him the color white. He sent the second one to the southwest, giving him the color red. 
he sent the third to the northwest, giving him the color yellow. And he sent the fourth one to the northeast, giving him the color black. I'll come back to an explanation of them a little on, further on. Thus it is that everything the Cheyenne in the Cheyenne circle moves in that specific clockwise direction. For the Cheyenne, the circle is not closed. It has a slight opening in the east. And this symbolic opening is for spirit. Every individual spirit enters and through which it leaves this world. And this outer circle represents a road, which is viewed as the road of life. It is a road that the Cheyenne had traveled since the beginning of it spans every moment of their past from creation and it reaches far into an unknown future. It encompasses all the places that the Cheyenne have ever lived, now live, or will ever live. It is a road of life that follows the movement of the sun from the east to the south to the west, to the north, and back to the east, making a complete circle. The Cheyennes collectively walk this road. Individually, however, each makes what is called a journey. And individually, each Cheyenne makes a journey of life with the people <coughs> on a road of life. And so we must train or educate our minds for this incredible journey we are each walking. So I've had to educate my mind and train myself for this journey that I have been walking for 82 years. And I have to keep training and educating myself for how, however much time I have yet to walk on my journey on this road of life with the people. And so this circle is divided into quadrants, which looks like a huge X, positioned by the semi-cardinal directions of southeast, southwest, northwest, northeast. And that first quadrant is what? I'm into that. And it represents the springtime of one's life. It represents birth, infancy, and childhood, up to about 12 years of age. And there, there are, you know, four relations of birth, four relatives, each of a different color. <laughs> and this quarter signifies the white relatives. Most importantly, it embodies the greatest element of life, water. Life is water and water is life. Advance and around this gigantic circle, the next quarter is red. It represents the summertime of one's life, youth. Blood and earth. It is time for <coughs> learning, particularly from one's elderly traditional knowledge keepers. And it signifies the red relatives and it embodies the element earth or land or soil. And going further on around the earth circle, the third quarter is the color of yellow. It represents the fall time of one's life or adulthood. And I would say most of you are in that phase. Maturity, 
It is a time when one becomes parents or grandparents, when a person becomes very active in the life of the community, particularly in its spiritual ways. And it signifies the yellow relatives, and it embodies the element air or wind, which is critical for life. <coughs> no, air is so vital. We use it to speak with. And, you know, we might be able to live maybe five minutes without air. And advance in all around the circle to the final quadrant, we get to the color black. Some societies say blue, but it represents the winter time of one's life. It is a time of the elderliness. My time. My time. The time of wisdom. Yeah, there might be some that say I'm not quite so wise, but I like to think. I really try. I really try it hard. But peace. A complete cessation of hostilities. It is a time to share one's knowledge with all of those younger. However, it is when fires go out and only black holes remain. You know, as medicine people were told not to even keep charcoal in the house. It symbolizes death. It's a time when one takes that final step through that symbolic opening in the earth circle to return to the world of spirit. The journey has been completed with the people on the Cheyenne Road of Life. This quarter signifies the black relatives of Earth and embodies the fourth element, fire. What I have compactly described is a circle that contains the four components of all life. Earth, air, fire, water. It contains the four relations of Earth, the white, the red, the yellow, and black the upright two-legged walkers with five fingers. Then there are all the other people, the four-legged, those rooted, those that fly, those that crawl, the stone people, the celestial beings, on and on. In short, all life is contained within that circle. Made from the same life elements, the universe is one gigantic kinship system. We live in a relational universe in which everything is alive and stands in sacred and proper relationship to everything else. We are taught to live as good relatives, one to another, as humans and to everything in our environment. Every being is related to every other possible thing or every possibility of being. In this mutually interrelated world, every individual also has certain kinship obligations or responsibilities. We exist in a universe characterized by interdependence and interrelatedness. I have very quickly described my nation's view of a circle that encompasses all life, even the sun, the moon, and the stars. It is traditional law for living. It is a humble blueprint for life. It's not written in any law book, but it is a law that governs all life. And I know that there are other indigenous nations that have similar concepts that can help maintain our kinship ties and obligations to one another and to this beautiful blue planet Earth, our own.
Thank you, Henry. Well, another round of applause for Dr. Henrietta Mann. In continuing our conversation about traditional law, law that preceded written law, human law, if you will, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a man of international prestige, a man that's, that has uh, been with us for a long time, has given us good direction, good guidance. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Oren Lyons. You want to hear or no, I'll start here. Okay. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being well. That's our greeting. And um, <clears throat> I want to appreciate the words of, uh, of Henrietta uh, and last night, uh, Deborah's presentation, and more. They're going to hear much more. We'll start right out because, you know, we're operating now on Indian time. <laughs> There's just no way around that. <laughs> and uh, it vexes our brothers sometimes, you know, how we arrive. And at one time we, we had a meeting with the Lakotas and uh, we arrived and their Indian time was two days. <laughs> so it's all relative. I want to start right away because we, we have a lot to cover. And I've been trying to organize my thoughts over these days as to um, <clears throat> how to approach and uh, add to the discussion here and perhaps give some information. But so we'll start right away with, um, <clears throat> with identity. And um, right now I'm gonna use one of my brother's inventions. <laughs> we didn't have this before, you know. <laughs> You know, sometimes we get angry at our brother and, and uh, then we have to think, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can't be mad at him all the time. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't be here without my pacemaker with a steel hip. It's too bad he doesn't have common sense. Ah, uh, but dollars and cents. Uh, that, I think, is the discussion. 
Anyway, um, I'm going to read a little bit because I was trying to organize my thoughts. Uh, on, on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, <clears throat> the 18th, our new board member, Tariwa, Tahiru, Tahuri, correct or not? Close? Amadi from New Zealand introduced herself and her family to our board and her father and mother and sisters and brothers introduced themselves and then their father the eldest wearing a cape of feathers formally introduced himself in the protocol of the Māori nation it was in detail and the time, and it took time in the ancient protocols of their people, and at the end, finished with a song. And just as we started this morning's session with a song, our nations cannot operate without song. They just cannot operate without the songs that we have. So it was evident then and this morning. And so the it ensured me in this introduction I was impressed and I have been there, I've been in their nation before and I've been greeted in her traditional way where the men have come up to me and ah. <laughs> It's a good one, I like that. <laughs> and um, and that introduction assured me that their their Māori nation is still here, vibrant and understood who they are, so And this then is the main subject of our discussion throughout these next days, is identity. Who are we? To know who are we? To know. And the 20, 16 World Indigenous Law Conference. Again, that's a mouthful. <laughs> you know, when we first went to Geneva in 1977, indigenous people were not on any radar screen. We were almost, almost wiped out. And from those times, we've resurged and uh, recovered and we have a conference How about that from people all around the world so then the gift of our ancestors and our grandmothers and grandfathers is our identities the identities of our peoples and the work we do today in the coming days is to pass that gift on to our children and grandchildren and future generations. That's our work. It's the work of any generation. And so, the great gift of identity to know who we are. Language. Language is a soul of a nation. Land and life, where we live, what we know. The word indigenous, we chose for ourselves in a meeting in Victoria in 1975, prior to our first journey to Oz. We went to the land of Oz. <laughs> and we saw 
many, <laughs> many, many wizards. But at that time, when we were preparing, when we were preparing to go, we decided, and we had a very, very long discussion, and uh, Arthur Manuel, where's Arthur? Is he here? Arthur's father, George Manuel, was presiding at that time in Victoria, 1975. And we decided at that time, after a lot of discussion, <coughs> that when we went to Oz, we would describe ourselves and introduce ourselves as the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And we chose indigenous peoples because it covered the islands, it covered the ice in the north, and it covered the jungles in the south, and it covered the great plains, and it covered all of our people, indigenous, the ones who are original to the land. And that's how we introduced ourselves. But that discussion took place in Victoria, great meeting. We had delegates from North, Central, and South America there at that time. And the development and the reintroduction of our <coughs> nations and our peoples to the world uh, was gaining strength. My uh, introduction to myself, uh, uh, I should taking the lead from my elders from Māori land to introduce myself. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an Onondaga from our homelands. We're one of the few people that couldn't move. And it's been tough. So we are in the Northeast, and we are still there. And the village of Onondaga is very, very old. Thousands of years old, we don't know. And we were coming from the Southwest in our journey, we know that, uh, long, long ago. And uh, the water was good there. The land was good, the lakes, so we set camp. Been there a long time now. And still there. Our lands, one time described by an English map maker that I saw in the archives of the London, Great London Museum, a map. 1602, describing the territories of the Haudenosaunee using our proper name. Amazing to me, 1602. And it started in Nova Scotia, went straight across to the great James Bay, down the west coast a lake they call Michigan today, following the river to the great Mississippi, down the Mississippi, across what you we now call Georgia, and up back to Nova Scotia. And this map said the territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois. Well, of course. <laughs> That's a big piece of land. <laughs> and that wasn't our territory. So many nations, many people there. And I pondered that map. And I said, what? And then uh, it came clear to me that what it was was not a map of our, of our lands, but it was a map of our influence. That's what it was. 
So if it, if it was a color, then, you know, in the lakes and what is now central New York, it would be bright red in the Ohio's. And then it would fade to almost nothing in those areas. I think that's the only way you can look at it. And so our, uh, our influence was, was very large. And I could see that, at least in their minds. And I think in ours as well. And so in this discussion that we have today, the overlapping of these influences of our people and the mobilities of our people, we move, we're great, great travelers. We were great travelers, every one of us, every nation. They went, always want to see what's over the next hill. Ah, I'll go one more hill. <laughs> oh, that's just water, no more hills. <laughs> I'll go back. Some of our people, all of you, all of your nations, your people, gone for years. And then they would return and tell these great stories, who they saw, and maybe return with a beautiful lady from another land. We were good at that. <laughs> and so, some of the rules our brother brought across the water were really weird. <laughs> okay. It was always a great interest to us. We watched him all the time did such strange things, and he was somebody to reckon with. Anyway, getting back to our, our, our purpose here, and uh, the, what we call international law, or it's well pointed out, natural law, nation law. If there is one law, I would say, consistent across across our our nations, wherever we were, that law was to share. Fundamental law, share what you have. And if it was four people and three beans, well, you're going to have to cut one bean in half. That's how we share. And, and it was common. Everybody did that. And, and it was fundamental. And also it was pointed out that our responsibilities as peoples included all life. When the chiefs of our nation, the Hoyane, chief is an English term. I think it's English. Anyway, we have our own terms for our leaders, and it doesn't mean what I know chiefs engenders in the minds of our brothers, sisters from across the water. When they say chief, they see this big man sitting on a horse with big feathers and a big lance, chief. Hoyane means the peacemakers the good minds, to work for the welfare of the people. It's a whole lot different. And so, we were fortunate. Our history, and as pointed out, all of our nations have histories. And it's important for you to keep those histories. It's important for you to maintain those histories because there's instructions there. There's authority there. There's responsibility there. And then one of the responsibilities is to pass that on to the generations coming. So in our story, in our histories, 
and, uh, and the cosmologies of, of, the, of the indigenous people of the world, there's an amazing similarity. We always recognize, I don't care where, what nation, where you are from, or all, we recognize the authority of the natural world. We know that. And we have rules and obligations and responsibilities and respect. So along with the traditional law, I would say, to share, is the other law that goes with it, and that's respect. We always had respect. We had very long protocol, and as was pointed out by our Mahdi nation, the protocols that we have based on respect. Respect for yourself, respect for life, respect for the future. It's still there, it's the law, and we have to maintain it. We have to promote it, and we have to, to instill it in our children. And the great law of love, that word that we use extends to everything, as was mentioned again by Henrietta, the butterflies. I look for butterflies today, and I'm so pleased when I see one, because he's still out there, still working. But I grew up in a time when the fields were thousands of butterflies. We used to chase them. You could never catch them. But we used to just chase them. There were so many. Now you go and look at those fields and you see a single butterfly come floating by. That's the condition of our earth today. If you're observant and you watch and you're concerned for these elements, which is the responsibility of leadership and all of our people, you will see what is occurring. How the fish may be coming or may not. It may not come up. Water's too low. You know, fish turn in an instant. They like cold water. All the fish like cold water. They hit warm water it's like this, that fast. They don't hang around and say, is this cold or warm? Boom, they're gone. <laughs> they know. And then we're sitting there with our nets and our spears, waiting. We've interfered with that now, big time. The story of how we came to be here, you know, started long ago, but in a contemporary fashion. I'm going to move up a little bit and get back into this little few notes I've made here. I, have, I wander around quite a bit, so I have to make some notes. In the uh, early summer of 1972, there was a meeting of Indian nations convened at a hotel that was close to the United Nations in New York City. Six nations, Lakota, Hopi, representatives from Oklahoma, and the fishing nations in the West, they were there. And at that time, uh, this meeting was, was uh, at the response of our Alfonso, Martinez Diaz. He was a, uh, I think that's him calling, is that him? <laughs> uh, 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 Alfonso was a, a anthropologist from Guatemala. And he gathered us there and he said, you know, you, you Indian nations have History is important, responsibility. And began the discussion of how do we approach those doors of the United Nations? How do we 
enter there? How do we become part of that, or at least heard? That was the discussion there. And one of our old-time fighters, long gone now, most all those people there at that time, 1972, Vine, Vine Deloria, he, he was our, he was our professor, he was a historian, and he was uh, passionate about this business. It was good to have him. And personally, I was a young man at that time, and had agreed to take on the responsibility of a Hati Hunda, faith keeper. The Turtle Clan, the Onondaga Nation. Clan mother had asked me at that time, would I come back from New York City, where I was working for 10 years? Uh, I wasn't quite an account executive, but uh, I was in charge of uh, 250 artists. She said, we need your help back here. And I was just getting traction. And I thought about it, and of course I had a family. And uh, my partner uh, wasn't agreeable. So it was very difficult. But I did make the choice to come back, and I, I agreed to accept that responsibility of that position. And I've been there ever since. And uh, in order to really sit there in that council, I had to become an Adaga, because at that particular time I was Seneca, my mother was Seneca, wolf clan. And we go by the mother's side, determine our nation. So I was a Seneca wolf, still a wolf.